Welcome back to r slash neighbors from hell, where people share stories about their crazy neighbors. And if you are new to my channel, please don't forget to subscribe to join our amazing community. And without any further ado, let's dive right into the stories. The first one is titled, Neighbor constantly monitored my property. I paid $80,000 for 20 mature palm trees to block his view. Do you know there are memes going around about Karens on the internet? How they are entitled and rude and think they are doing themselves or the others around them some sort of favor? Well, let me tell you, living right next to one is absolute hell. The story starts like this. I am 43 years old and I had just bought a new house with my wife and two kids. Both of my sons are in their teenage years and while we all know how fun that can be, they were pretty well behaved. We purchased a home in a quiet neighborhood. It was one of those neighborhoods that screamed American dream, white picket fence, but the neighbors seemed friendly and the home was spacious for a good price. We did not move in right away after buying the home as we wanted to make some renovations and whatnot before we moved in. It only took about two months as we were pretty set on what we wanted and knew how we wanted it to look. And during these two months we visited the house about twice a week to check up on progress. I guess I should have picked up the red flags right then and there when the next door neighbor came over one day while we were visiting and introduced herself to us. She introduced herself as Martha and immediately began telling us about the old lady that lived here before us, who sadly passed away. She said that we better make sure we take care of the house because the old lady loved this house dearly and it was one of her biggest prides and joys. At first I just thought that she was concerned about the house which I guess could be weird. But it could also mean that she admired the elderly lady and wanted to make sure the house was kept up in her honor. I'm not really sure but either way, I myself would not feel comfortable telling a stranger that they better take care of their house regardless of the circumstances. The second incident happened after we moved in. We had painted the outside of the house a deep brown color but had left other accents such as the white window frames the same. Martha came over two days after we moved in and asked us if we had planned on getting rid of any of the garden beds or rose bushes out front. I said that no, we didn't, but we might add a few palm trees and remodel the backyard. Martha was quick to let us know that the previous owner loved her rose bushes and the flowers in the backyard and it would be a shame if we ever got rid of them. It was honestly a little uncomfortable mainly because I did not know what to say. Well, flash forward to a couple of weeks later, I noticed that Martha had installed security cameras on her house. This normally would not be my business as I don't care what people do with their homes. However, I noticed that two cameras were specifically pointing towards my house. This was very strange and I did not feel comfortable with it at all. When Martha was outside one day, I had asked her about the two security cameras on the side of her house that were pointing towards mine. The girl had straight up told me that she wanted to make sure we were taking care of the house. Also she had noted that we had two teenage boys and that she knew how rowdy teenagers could be. She did not want my boys disrespecting the house. First of all, you have to be pretty ballsy to admit with no shame that you set up security cameras to spy on your neighbors. Secondly, did she not have anything better to do than to monitor and spy on us all day? We had not done anything to give anyone the impression that we were not going to take care of the house or that we were bad neighbors. So even though she mentioned the elderly lady that lived there before, I was not sure where she was really coming from. And with all due respect, I was starting to think that Martha was not all there. I had let her know that we were not comfortable with the cameras facing our house because it was not a good feeling knowing someone could be watching you any second. She had said that she would take them down after a couple of months after we proved we could take care of the house. Again, what the hell? This was not Martha's house nor was it her responsibility. The situation just kept getting weirder and weirder. She did not seem violent but my wife made a good point that if she was willing to spy on us through security cameras, what else was she willing to do? We purchased a set of security cameras as well and a matching alarm system but we knew that was not enough. We had to do something to create a sense of privacy which we had the right to in our own home. 
So I purchased $80,000 worth of full grown trees to have planted along the fence line so that her security cameras would be blocked by them. Yes, $80,000. I don't like to boast, but in cases like this, having money was nice. I could have saved a lot of money by just buying baby palm trees, but I did not want to wait for them to grow. By then, the cameras would have been gone. So instead, I put 20 mature palm trees and had landscapers create a fence out of them along the edges of my fence. This worked out perfectly because Martha was absolutely pissed. We did end up reporting the whole situation to the police. They said there was not much they could do because Martha's cameras also captured a large portion of her yard as well. So to anyone looking at the footage, they would just assume Martha was monitoring her property. But regardless, the palm trees annoyed Martha and well, that made me happy. And yeah, ripe stars, if there was a neighbor that put up security cameras to spy on you, what would you have done? Let us know in the comments and while you're at it, I would really appreciate it if you could also like the video if you enjoy my content as that would help me tremendously. Thank you so much in advance. The next one is titled Security Light Revenge. Years ago when my wife and I had purchased a home, the builder had told us it might be part of an HOA depending on how many homes they ultimately constructed. We were among the first five buyers, so we pretty much had free reign to change what we wanted via permissions from the builders that those changes would be added to what was turned over to the HOA and for as long as we lived there, the changes could stay. The one change we did was add a motion security light on the back of our fence because my neighbor's kid would smoke weed there and I did not want to smell it sitting on my patio or when I had the windows open on nice evenings. Well, that went up my neighbor's butt sideways for whatever reason and she refused to believe that her kid would be doing that even though it did not point towards any other home, just a grass between my fence and the woods. It kept the kids from smoking weed there without calling the cops on something so foolish and petty. But since it was cleared from the builder, she could not do anything. Well, six months later we end out with an HOA and she makes it priority number one to get the lights, several other neighbors followed what I did whose home faced the wooded area, removed. The requirement to get it changed since they were builder approved was 80% of the community so the only votes to keep came from those of us on the back of the property. So we have to remove them being permanent changes. Not even three days later, her kid is again back there smoking weed. The HOA counter to why I had it was to call the police non-emergency number, but that's absolutely stupid to risk some kid's life up because he wanted to smoke something. When that is an issue, his parents, who remember don't believe he does it, deal with. So now I am pretty livid, this North American land whale cried to the point that I had to remove a cheap and non-disruptive fix because she refused to be a parent and keep her kid from impeding on us, so it is time for me to be petty. The next day after her kid first went back there, I go out and buy a 12 foot section of 4x4 wire, concrete, a large planter and three 6000 lumen floodlights and built essentially a mini portable stadium light setup rigged to the motion sensor so whenever anyone passed by my fence instead of being a small area, immediately behind my house lit up, the sun came out of the woods with one light giving her home an x-ray. The first time her kid went back there it was glorious so I got a picture of him with his bong in his hand before he skirted off so I could show her proof. And it sent her through the roof getting those free x-rays. I showed her the picture and she still did not care, saying if it goes off again I will call the police. And I was fine with it because I told her they would see the same picture I had just shown her. In reality they would not, but Martha the manatee did not know that and I did not expect her to try to call my bluff, which she never did. She just complained to the HOA a lot. In the morning time I would lay the contraption down so it could not be seen and raise it up after it got dark. About a week after this I get a summons to the HOA meeting that is happening that week and since it was disciplinary for my contraption, their lawyer was there and they wanted to hear my case. 
So I lay everything out from the builder to pictures showing how the original light did not shine any brighter than the one on her porch and could not be seen from inside the homes, as well as her vendetta to change the HOA rules to suit what she wanted. Three of the five other neighbors who had to remove their security lights were also there to argue for getting them back when I went. After about 40 minutes, the lawyer comes back and pretty much said, Well, Mr. and Mrs. Chief Bruders, you are right. This is not a permanent structure, so it is technically allowed. However, you cannot have a light facing her property any longer. In addition, by the first of next month, you will all be allowed to reinstall your smaller lights, as they did provide a measure of security that benefits the property as a whole. So Martha, the manatee, was blessed with another week of the sun on a pole and being mad mad about it. Those of us who lived facing the woods got our lights back and after reselling the lights I made most of my money back that I spent on supplies making that monstrosity. It was absolutely worth spending the few hundred dollars to out petty a bad parent and insufferable neighbor. And yeah ripe stars I would say that was textbook petty revenge. The next one is titled, Not Enough Hours? Okay. I was reading some posts about employers judging employees based on idle time and such during the pandemic and it reminded me of this one at my last job. A few years ago I worked as a field engineer for a call recording company. I worked primarily with 911 agencies and would integrate recording systems with radio and phone systems to record the calls and radio traffic. If you have heard a 911 call on the news from one of a few states along the east coast, there is a very good chance I built and installed that system. As part of our company's policy, we would do preventive maintenance every six months. This was where we went on site, tested everything was functioning properly and showed some value in our maintenance contracts through FaceTime with the customers. After some years I had climbed the ladder to being the lead engineer, installer and trainer. I trained most of the other engineers and techs within the company along with performing my normal duties. I had also installed the vast majority of the systems I was doing maintenance on and was extremely familiar with them. A maintenance visit took me around an hour where it took the new guys 4 to 5 hours and I would usually knock out 2 to 3 maintenance visits in a single day. I had literally triple the numbers as the next closest tech. As often happens, eventually the company was bought out. The new owner came in and presented himself as very metrics focused. The problem was that he did not understand what we did in the field so his metrics were not always good ones. Eventually I got written up and put on a performance improvement plan. The reason? Days I did not have to drive far, I would finish 3 maintenance visits and still be home in less than 6 hours. Again, my actual performance metrics were legitimately triple the next closest tech and most days I worked well over 8 hours when driving was included, but instead of looking at those metrics he used time as his only metric and focused solely on the shortest days. And unfortunately for me, I objectively worked less time than anyone else. Now for the malicious compliance, instead of scheduling the way I had previously, I started scheduling to ensure I hit 8 hours a day, every day. Previously, I had started at a customer site at 9am, whether it was 1 hour away or 5, so I would get up at whatever time that day required. I would also try to knock out multiple customers in the same area on the same trip to save driving time on longer days. Some days I would drive 12 hours total, knock out 3 maintenance visits taking another few hours and have a total of 15 plus hours. Afterwards I left for sites at exactly 8am and tried to get home at exactly 5pm. For those sites that were 5 hours away, I cannot do them without a hotel room, instead of costing a full tank of gas and a single day's wages for 3 clients, it now costs the company the same amount of gas, 3-4 to four nights in a hotel and multiple days of my salary. For closer sites that I did not need a hotel, I would make sure I did not leave too soon to get home at exactly 5pm, so would sit in a server room playing games on my phone for a few hours. If sites were close enough, I would still try to knock out 2 or sometimes 3, but if time was the metric, I was going to make sure I worked as closely to 8 to 5 as possible without doing anything detrimental to a customer. 
Overall, I was trying to make a point to show that while I may have been meeting the time metric, I was actually doing less work by meeting that metric. We did employee reviews every quarter, so when my next review came around three months later, I tried to bring it up again. Instead, the new owner praised me for working harder and ignored that I was doing significantly less work. During that meeting, I tried showing that it was costing the company more and I was achieving less by meeting that metric instead of an actual performance metric. But somehow, despite my spreadsheets showing costs, site visits, completed maintenance and everything else, he refused to understand it. He kept praising how my work ethic had improved and did not want me to change anything or go back. So I did not change a thing and coasted at that job for the next few years. The next one is titled It's My Car. I'm not exactly sure this fits the subreddit, but I want to share this story, so here it goes. When I was 18, late 1990s, I had a silver AMC spurt with powder blue interior. I did not know anything about cars, but it was a sexy little oil dribbling thing. It had ball tires that would spin the car 360 if I did not brake cautiously, but I loved it. Until it died unexpected and I had to have it towed to a shop a week before I was to leave the country for four months. I was a kid and I did not know cars and something major was wrong that I don't remember, but I could not afford to fix it. Something like four grand to repair, I could not afford it and was leaving the country for a while anyway. The mechanic said I could just leave it there and they would just deal with it or scrap it if I didn't care. Cool. I no longer have a car, but I am leaving anyway, so who cares? I paid the bill for the work they did and left. When I got home from my many months abroad, I went through a massive stack of mail that included one letter saying the car had been impounded, another that it had been auctioned off and after the auction date, several parking tickets that amounted to about $400. I called the city and asked how I could be liable for parking tickets after the car was auctioned to a new owner, they said it was still in my name. The new owner had not changed the title, it was my responsibility. I was furious but what could I do? The title was in my name and they could not even give me the name of the person who bought it. I had to pay or it would be sent to collections. So I am walking to my friend's apartment a block away from my old place and right across the street from her building I see my car. I still have keys so I go home and frantically grab them and go back. I get into the car and start pulling all the papers from the glove box and then sort through them looking for the new owner's name. Just then two guys run up screaming that I am in their car and what the hell do I think I'm doing. I say, you bought it from an auction and did not change the title. You owe me 400 bucks for the parking tickets in my name. They insist they don't owe me anything. Not my fault you left it in your name. I smile and calmly start the engine and say, okay then, it's in my name, it's legally mine, and drive away. Thanks for repairing the engine. Added for clarification, I was young and naive, I could not afford to have the car towed outside the city to the house of friends or family, remember I was leaving the country for four months, there was nowhere off the street in the city to leave it, let alone have it repaired. The mechanic was kind and said he would take it off my hands, which was a relief. But remember, the young and naive thing? Yeah, I handed him the title and thought that was all I had to do. The mechanic apparently pushed the car onto the street from where it was impounded. It was then auctioned off by the city. The city gave the title to the new owner. The parking tickets were racked up by the new owner. There were dates on all this paperwork that was mailed to me. I did try to fight the tickets, had a copy of the bill of sale from the auction, but they still said there was nothing they could do because the buyer did not transfer the title into their name. Back and forth to different government offices, all the while new tickets were being issued. I was annoyed that the city didn't have to transfer the title out of my name when they claimed possession of it, but sold it and gave the buyer the title. The same one I handed the mechanic. So it was late last night when I recalled this story and decided to share it on Reddit, but here is a bit that I left out. When I got into the car and checked the paperwork in the glove box, I found the title. Still in my name, they had not even signed it, also in the glove box was their bill of sale from the auction. They were clearly young and naive too. 
Edit number two, what happened after? Never heard from them again. I had the car for another year or two, put new tires on it and sold it properly before another trip abroad. And you better believe it, I had them sign the title in front of me and I filed the sale with the DMV that day, giving them I think a week to file or be fined. And ripe stars with this we have reached the end of the video, however if you still cannot get enough of my content then I would highly suggest to check out my endless binge watch playlist which will soon show up in the left corner of the screen. In addition I would really appreciate it if you could not only subscribe to the channel but also turn on the bell notifications which you can do by clicking on the little bell icon right next to the subscribe button. This will help my channel tremendously and this will make sure that you don't miss any of my videos. Furthermore if you want to see additional ripe content that I don't post on YouTube then I would suggest to head on over to patreon.com slash ripe YouTube for more than 50 50 exclusive videos that you will not see anywhere else. Thank you so much for your amazing daily support and I hope to see you again tomorrow.